Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In his short work on fate, where Cicero is concerned with the question of determinism, causality, and human freedom, one of the key positions that Cicero is going to examine is the Epicurean one. They were a very important school of his own time, and he's going to target Epicurus explicitly. Now, he has access to texts that unfortunately we ourselves don't possess, but we can reconstruct what the Epicurean position was from what he's saying here. And what he's saying is very consistent with other sources discussing the Epicureans. Epicurus himself, which many people probably know from ethics as a hedonist philosopher, in terms of his metaphysics, was an atomist. So he's in that tradition along with Democritus and perhaps Leucippus. And uh, his school, in fact, adopted atomism as its fundamental understanding of the natural world and thereby also of the human psyche, which is what we're concerned with here. And Epicurus, taking this theory over from Democritus, made a few adjustments to it. Now, what is the atomic theory? The atoms simply mean the things that cannot be cut any further. So whatever the smallest particles of matter are, they were materialists, those are constantly falling in a void. So gravity is one of the main forces of the universe affecting everything. And those atoms come together into complexes and affect each other causally. So they're all falling. They, they wind up in certain systematic causal connections with each other. They also impact each other and produce effects in that way. And now this is a rather crude way of trying to understand the universe, but, but it really works. If, if we take away perhaps the falling or some of these other aspects of it, and we ignore the fact that Epicurus didn't have access to the natural science of our own time, there's a certain plausibility to this. And Epicurus saw very clearly, according to Cicero, that there would be some fatalistic implications to this mechanistic atomic theory that's essentially materialist, saying that everything that we experience, everything that exists is just atoms within the void put together in certain combinations and engaging with each other in certain ways. Now those ways are regular. So that means that if they are put together in a certain manner, that's going to produce the same effect. It's gonna cause something that we can distinguish perhaps if it's something visual or taste-wise. It's gonna produce the same effect every single time. Now if you extend this to the entire universe, you get a completely fatalistic, determined universe, don't you? And Cicero says that Epicurus um, brought in a new element to the theory. And he says the reason why Epicurus brought in this theory was his fear that if the atom was always carried along by the natural and necessary force of gravity and the impact and all these other things, we should have no freedom whatever since the movement of the mind was controlled by the movement of the atom. And he, he also says, the author of the atomic theory, Democritus, preferred to accept the view that all events are caused by necessity rather than deprive the atoms of their natural motions. 
So Epicurus is innovating and his grand innovation is what we call the swerve. There is a declination, a turning aside. And again, it helps if you do visualize all the atoms as falling in the void. Uh, now, where are they falling towards? There is no actual place. But just imagine all the atoms proceeding in the same path. And every then, once in a while, one of those atoms turns aside and it collides with other atoms and it produces a new combination. And in that moment, when there's the swerve, something new comes into being or something escapes the bounds of a fatalistic determinism or necessity. Something that escapes the ordering of things comes back into the ordering of things. And, and things act causally after that. So even though there is this moment of change, it's not as if everything becomes totally random. But what does this do? It introduces a certain measure of randomness, a randomness that is unpredictable. You can't even decide just when and why an atom will swerve aside at this point rather than at this point, why this atom rather than that atom. So there is a genuine randomness there, isn't there? What we would nowadays call indeterminacy. You, you could say there's a whole range of possible ways the atom could swerve and maybe those are limited, right? But you don't know which one it's going to go into. It's not yet determined. Once it actually does slide over here and collide with this other atom over here or connect up with it, okay, now that is determined. But how it's going to go, which one it's going to hook up with, that isn't determined. So what this gives us, <clears throat> you could say on a micro level, over and over and over again, is an escape from fatality, an escape from fate. And in Epicurus's view, this is what gives us genuine freedom. Now, Cicero has some problems with this, as do some other authors who he brings in, particular Carneades, the academic philosopher. One of the biggest problems with this is, he, is Cicero says this is actually incoherent because we want to have some sort of causal account of things that can provide us with intelligibility to the universe, as well as to our own decision-making and all of that. So the swerve is problematic because the swerve itself takes place without any cause. That's why you can't predict it, because there is no cause for the swerve. And Cicero, you know, raises several different issues and problems uh, for this. He says that this, this is actually a, a big issue for the Epicureans. Why this swerve? Why not more swerves? Why not all sorts of other things along these, these lines? He says this really is not helping us to explain anything. Um, later on, he'll say, the atom does swerve, Ep Epicurus says. In the first place, what causes the swerve? For the motive force they will get from Democritus is a different one, a driving force turned by him, a blow from you, Epicurus, they will get the force of gravity or weight. What fresh cause therefore exists in nature to make the atoms swerve? Or do the atoms cast lots among themselves, which is to swerve and which not? Or to swerve is, is the reason for their making a very small swerve and not a large one, or for their making one very small swerve and not two or three swerves. And he concludes... This is actually wishful thinking, not investigation of the natural world. This is just making something up. This is providing an explanation that doesn't really explain anything. But this has been an attractive way of reintroducing freedom into a deterministic universe for many people, as we'll talk about in just a moment. There is a bigger problem, however, Epicurus not only has something that 
is escaping causality by seemingly suspending causality altogether at particular moments and doesn't seem to be very intelligible. But this is supposed to explain human freedom. And this swerving of atoms really does not yield us distinctively human freedom, the freedom of the will, the voluntas here in Cicero. It doesn't give us a freedom of our own movements of our mind, something that Aristotle himself already noted in calling us self movers, something that Cicero is going to hold on to, something that Carneades, the academic skeptic who he's, he's talking about here, thinks is absolutely essential, something that even the Stoic Chrysippus wants to hold on to as well, even though Chrysippus wants to have a deterministic universe and wants to have our willings determined and yet in a certain sense also chosen by us and free and within our power. Does Epicurus get us anything remotely like this? No, we just have randomness at a very low level. In some respect, this is similar to people in our own time who want to say that the, the indeterminacy at a micro level shown to us by uh, various physical theories like quantum mechanics somehow yields us freedom of the will when really freedom of the will would have to be something at a much higher level, something that we can distinctively relate to and say, aha, I, I experienced that. That's something that I work with. I think that other people have that. Mere randomness is not the same thing as freedom. And as Cicero points out, the reason why this is the case is because if we want to talk about any, anything like freedom of the mind or freedom of the will, that is not being completely determined by fate or necessity or whatever else it is that we think is, is completely controlling things, then we have to look at it in terms of our own self-determination. We have to be causes. And we're not going to get causes out of an account that is in effect saying causes are suspended every so often, but at this very low level, we're not getting causes in the sense that we actually need here to have a true account of human freedom. So Cicero is rejecting this account on two main grounds. One is that the swerve itself seems to be unintelligible. It doesn't really make sense. It seems to be sort of a, a made up hypothesis just to get Epicurus out of trouble, but it doesn't even achieve what it's supposed to do in the, the account that he's able to provide. So this is Cicero's critical analysis of Epicureans on freedom and fate.